Hi, I'm David, and I'm going to give you a brief description of my life as it is right now to show you why it is that it's getting harder and harder to be middle class in America. This is the Capitol building of Topeka. I live in Topeka, Kansas. As you can see, it's under construction. It's been under construction as long as I can remember, like the roads around here. It's a project that they start that they never finish. I don't think anything ever gets finished around here. And if ever I lived in a city where it's more about who you know than what you know, this is definitely it. Well, we're on 24th and Clay, and this yellow house is, or was, my first house in Topeka that I had purchased um, almost 12 years ago. It's the house that the court took from me and gave to my ex, told her that she could have it as long as uh, she had the children, and even when they took the children away, she still resided here. Um, they never enforced anything. She had wrecked the house. When she disappeared, and moved out of the state. The state contacted me after a while, about a year ago actually, because of the overdue taxes. The whole time she lived in there, she never paid them. And offered me to have the house back if I paid the taxes, which I did. And then entered the house and found it piled to the ceiling with garbage. Um, she was a terrible hoarder and the house was destroyed and ruined. It took me months to clear it out. Um, sold quickly for next to nothing and the IRS seized the uh, the income from that sale so I got zero and then denied it the uh, the IRS it took my accountant and my tax attorney practically a year to find where the IRS had applied that money there was no record This is the, uh, the SRS building behind me, and the SRS building stands for Social and Rehabilitation Services, which is a very politically correct term for Department of Public Welfare. Uh, they have quite a nice thick file on me, thanks to my ex. She, uh, she made, I believe, about 35 or 36 false claims against me uh, during the trial periods, which they investigated all of them and unsubstantiated and closed all of them. But it's still uh, damaging. It's something I like to call bullying by proxy, and that's getting someone else to do the bullying for you. trying to uh, get a hold of my my youngest son's mother. He's with her right now. He kind of bounces back and forth. He's six years old. He, uh, he's with her right now and I can't get a hold of her because all the numbers I have for her are disconnected again. That's two cell phones. I can't get a hold of her. And no answer at the house number, which there never is. It's kind of... Uh, frustrating really. I don't like him not ever really being sure where he is or who he's with or what's going on. He needs better stability than that.
I'm out by the uh, Topeka Rescue Mission. This is the homeless shelter. Uh, this is where my oldest lives. He uh, never actually recovered psychologically from what he experienced while he was living with his mother before custody was reversed. And he suffers from a great deal of depression and other issues. And he has been homeless for years. Uh, will not work, will not accept help. Um, there's really nothing that can be done for him. You have to be willing to accept help in order to in order to move forward. He just isn't willing or isn't ready, whatever is going on in his mind. He never recovered from it. Well, I'm in front of part of the Frito-Lay plant owned by PepsiCo. I used to work here. I worked here a few years ago as a skilled processor, which uh, basically means I literally made the chips. Um, they have forced overtime in this plant, and I was going through a separation, and I had a little small child, little boy, no one to watch him and couldn't take the forest over time. And so I kept getting hit with, with what's called a quarter demerit. And they were piling up and it was eventually in my best interest to have to quit rather than be fired for that. And at that time, the, uh, the union, the local 218, um, very, very poorly represented me, if at all. I could speak to them one day and the next day they didn't know what I was talking about. Um, so, as I said, I was forced to quit. It was a pretty good job, though. This was a YRC2 center. I used to be the director here, and that means youth residential center, level two. Juvenile corrections, basically. Uh, it was a rehabilitation center for juvenile females that were in trouble with the law. And they lived here, and I ran the place. I did that for a few years. Uh, we were shut down, the state cut the funding this one and a few other programs. Um, I believe that it was shut down as a scapegoat for some trouble they were having at their main correctional facility, their actual juvenile prison or jail. A lot of corruption, a lot of problems there, but they slammed a lot of smaller places before that. And so they closed us down and put me out of work. And I was a co-owner in this. And, you know, the irony of it is that we probably paid anywhere from eight to $12,000 a year in unemployment taxes, but because I was involved in the administration, I'm not eligible for unemployment. Well, I'm out at the computer, and I've got Intuit open, and that's an online payroll service that was used for the facility when I work there. And I need to access uh, the W-2s for 2012 for everyone, and I can't. I can get into the system. I can't access the W-2s, and I just got off the phone with, um, with their customer service representative, um, it's kind of hard to understand, of course. I think he, he must be in India or Pakistan or something, and it was hard for me to pick up on his accent. And he tells me, of course, that I can't access any data 
It will print off any W-2s until the account is reopened, at least long enough to pay it. So I have to pay at least a month um, of their service to get in to fulfill my legal obligation to distribute W-2s to the former employees. That's pretty dirty. Uh, they're basically holding my files hostage. It's like extortion. Um, and of course, it couldn't come at a worse time for me to have to scrounge up another month's payment for these guys while I have so much else uh, weighing on me as it is. Well, we're out in front of the Capitol building again, as you can see, but what I really wanted to show was the Jayhawk Tower, which is behind me here on my left side. As you can see the Jayhawk on the top of the building, that is actually the headquarters for the Juvenile Justice Authority. That is uh, a building full of experts with a lot of degrees who were very good at telling me how to do my job even though by their own admission they never worked with children. Um, just a testimonial to how education is a little bit more important than experience anymore. This is Four Town Site Plaza. As you can see, this is where the uh, Internal Revenue Service is located, my arch nemesis. Um, you know how they had the big deal some time ago, within the last couple of decades, about the Internal Revenue Service intimidating people, being threatening, being pushy, and they went through this whole revamping. It's not true. Um, they are very intimidating. They do make threats. Uh, or at least some of them still do because the agents that I've had to deal with have been very aggressive with me. Um, I owe a considerable amount of money to the IRS, mostly due to the, my involvement with the facility uh, where I was working, the YRC2 facility. Sorry, I can't tell you the name of it. The, uh, to the tune of some 30 plus thousand dollars. Originally they wanted 98,000. Then they said it was 68. The agent followed me around. He wrote down the license plate numbers of vehicles parked around the facility in my home. He asked me if I had any jewelry I could sell. Um, he was very pushy. He told me to write him a check for $68,000 or he'd never leave me alone. Turns out it wasn't 68, it was 32 or 34,000 actually that was owed. And more close to 80% of it apparently, according to my tax attorney, is penalties and interest due to some oversights from uh, the facilities, taxes and paperwork. Something that could have easily been fixed. I paid 15000 in taxes and didn't make a dent in it. Their monthly penalties and interest on that 30 something thousand is actually higher than the monthly payment. The payment's twenty two five. But the penalties and interest are almost $3,500. Um, I had to pay a tax attorney $3,000 that I don't have to freeze the taxes so that they couldn't, couldn't penalize me any further. It was uh, a necessary evil. Well, I have an eBay account, or I, I had one. It's still open, but I'm not allowed to sell on it anymore. I was uh, selling pretty much everything I have uh, for supplementing the income, and I had a problem with a, uh, with a customer. And this person had purchased jewelry from me, a little more than $3,000 worth, 
three purchases of uh, gold jewelry, and I sold all my jewelry. And he claimed it wasn't real, and I said, well, send it back. And he did not. What he did was he gave me three negative feedbacks, uh, contacted eBay customer support, and they extracted um, the money that they had paid out of my bank account right through PayPal, and then suspended my account. And the customer never returned anything. He kept it. So effectively, eBay helped one of their other customers rob me and then penalized me for it by suspending my ability to sell. Um, and I called eBay's customer support and told them this and talked to them about it. Hey, this guy never returned anything, just took my money and took my merchandise, didn't return it, won't respond to contacts. And the person who I spoke with and customer support told me that they are not authorized to do anything except take information. Where have I heard that before? Well, I have a nice monster pile of uh, credit card and other statements. Those are current. And I'm no longer in a position to be able to pay my credit card statements. Um, they got built up a lot out of necessity because I had no other way to pay other things. And I hate, I hated having to do that and I hate it even more now that I owe it. And last month and this month, I haven't paid them. And I really can't right now. It's, if it's a difference between utilities and other living expenses versus a credit card payment. I'm going to have to kick the credit card payment out. I don't like that because it is an obligation that I took and I do want to pay it. Um, I don't like the idea that if it never gets paid, it becomes somebody else's bill because that's really why um, credit card interest rates and other things are so high on people is because so many of them don't get taken care of properly and they don't get paid and it falls off on someone else and I don't want it to go on someone else um, but in the meantime I don't know what to do with them This is Biomat. Uh, this is something I've been forced to do to supplement my income. And basically what you do here is you sell your plasma. Um, they put an IV in you and they extract your blood. They filter most, if not all, of your blood and remove the plasma, about 24 ounces of it, or a pound and a half. And you can come here twice a week and they remove three pounds of your plasma, 48 ounces, put your whole blood back, and you're paid $50 for this. So if you ever wondered what uh, three pounds of your body is worth, it's 50 bucks. Which actually is helpful. Um, I've had to come here to supplement my groceries. They'll give me boxes of food and things like that based on your income, which I have done. So they have tried to help me out a little bit. You now, the one thing that strikes me about it is how awful some of the people that are coming here to get help are. How rude and pushy they can be with the staff here who is incredibly patient under the circumstances because I don't think I can tolerate too much of it. 
um, being yelled at, being threatened by people that you're trying to assist because they came here to basically beg. Uh, that's what it is. I need help. Can you give me a box of food? You don't, uh, you don't cuss the person out that you're asking something like that. Right now, I'm in front of the Shawnee County District Courthouse. Um, this place has been a menace to me. I was in a separation with a woman with uh, two children. She was mentally ill, and both of those children were being really quite terribly abused. But I'm male, and the attorney warned me at the time that the courthouse leans 80% female, and to be careful, and he wasn't kidding, because that sort of an 18th century mentality still occurs in this city, and in the laws and in the courts here. That's how they treat you. I wasn't listened to at all, despite the children's own testimony, despite the involvement of uh, SRS, which is the Department of Public Welfare, um, and various other agencies. This is the courthouse where the case manager violated my rights by taking personal information that she requested from me and the attorney, that she had requested in confidentiality and guaranteed confidentiality, and then turned it over to the opposition's attorney, uh, something that I was never able to afford to pursue or I would have, she violated my rights. The court violated my rights and violated the rights of those children again and again. It took five years before they finally recognized the abuse, removed the children, gave me custody. That, that woman, is now a fugitive from the law. She no longer resides in the state of Kansas. Uh, she's been missing for years, owes thousands in child support, has warrants for her arrest, and nothing, zero, has ever been done about it. Well, I'm on my way to the old uh, K&I complex. Um, that's where Town and Country Church does a food giveaway uh, once a month, which is nice to see a community church doing something for the community. It seems a lot of the time that uh, the churches, whenever they do their mission trips, they're doing it somewhere else. Uh, a lot of the times they're always, it seems like they're out digging a well in some country that no one ever heard of, um, rather than doing something in their own backyard. And I, I can kind of understand that. People, um, a lot of the time, they're scamming you or they're really ungrateful for the things that you do for them. I wouldn't want to do it either. I'd be very, very cautious um, in this country about helping anybody. There's always somebody working an angle and you never know who's for real and who isn't. But town and country, uh, you can see them doing their work and it's, I appreciate it anyways. Standing now out by Kansas uh, Child Support Enforcement, which uh, did their job very, very well when it was me paying child support before the children were seized by the court and turned over to me. Then they got very lax, non-existent. Um, I'm owed close to 7,000 now in back child support. It hasn't been paid in years. Last payment that I got was October of uh, 2009. And I believe it was a $19 payment after they took their commission.
Uh, she, as I had stated, you know, she no longer lives in Kansas. She, she's out of state. She lives in Nevada now. She's a fugitive in Kansas. She has warrants for her arrest. Um, and I informed them of where she was and her address and contact information years ago. And, you know, ironically enough, just a few days ago, I got a notice from this office telling me that they could not enforce uh, child support because it came to their attention that the mother no longer lives in Kansas and they can't pursue it outside of Kansas. So I guess it takes about two or three years from a for a memo to get from one desk to the other that this is new news to them. This is the Kia dealership. Um, I used to have a Kia, a Kia Sedona, and it was purchased uh, really for the facility, the YRC2. I and my partner had purchased it, and it had been repossessed because payments couldn't be made on it anymore after the facility closed down. Somehow my partner's name disappeared from it because they couldn't find her name on any of the paperwork. I remember sitting in the office right here at the uh, Briggs Keeler dealership and signing with her, but somehow her name's not on any of the paperwork anymore. I'd love to find out how that happened. This is Invista Credit Union. These are the people who repossessed the uh, key of Ann, the key of Sedona. They were kind enough to seize all of my bank accounts when that happened, including my children's uh, accounts. And when I came down to turn in the car, the agent who was responsible would not come out and speak to me. Um, every time I tried to co communicate with him, he was always in meetings and would always get back to me. I finally did get a hold of him and uh, explained to him that the accounts, or some of the accounts that he seized, actually belonged to my children and they weren't actually mine, which he denied um, until I was able to get him to look at the accounts and see that they were kangaroo club accounts. Not many adults have those. And he went on a big diatribe about how he didn't have to help me at all and was doing me a huge favor by releasing the uh, two children's accounts back to me so that I could close them out. That he didn't have to do anything for me and that he was helping me and didn't have to in the bank and him didn't owe me anything. Real nice attitude. Um, so they they took the van back and they sold it at auction for about half of what it was worth and stuck me with a huge bill for the difference. Well, I'm driving around Topeka and my Toyota Highlander which is a vehicle that is left over from the facility because my actual vehicle is gone, pretty much like the Kia Sedona is. Um, I'm behind on payments in it, and Toyota is less than cooperative. Um, I have spoken with their agents and called them on several occasions, and all of their agents can ever do 
is take information. No one I ever speak to is authorized to make any decisions or offer any assistance. And a lot of times it's difficult to understand them because of course, you know, you never know where the call center is. But the, uh, I'm stuck with the Highland there for now. I don't really like the truck. It's not very efficient. It's not really worth the price paid for it. Well, I'm up by my uh, middle son's dentist's office. He has braces, and they've been very gracious with me, but the fact of the matter is he's effectively trapped in his braces because I cannot afford to get them worked on or removed. Um, I don't have anything against the dentist's office. It is what it is, but, you know, you feel bad when you're crunched so much that it affects the people around you and in this case it affects him greatly because he can't get the care he needs to restore his teeth and get the braces removed because I can't pay them off. Well, now I'm in front of the Expo Center's Heritage Hall and Manor Conference Center. Uh, this is where the city of Topeka likes to do its kangaroo court. And to give you an example of what I mean by that, I was brought here. Usually on Wednesday mornings, they bring in some thousands of uh, people from around the city and sort them out and filter them out and charge them with various things and send them home. And I had a secretary that worked at the facility who had a garnishment on her wages that I didn't know about because, well, she was the secretary and I imagine she must have been throwing away her mail. They brought me here and I went up in front of the judge and they had a prosecutor from whoever it was that was in charge of the garnishment. And he looked at me and looked down at the paper and said, well, you know, these things have a lot of bite. Do you know what that means? And I said, no, sir, I don't. And he said, it means I find in favor of the plaintiff and signed it off. And the attorney laughed. And then she said, you're just like everyone else. You didn't do anything and don't know anything. And they sent me on my way. I thought the whole point of going to court was to be able to speak on your own behalf, not at Topeka. Well, we're back out at the Frito plant again because I worked here a second time. Um, after the YRC2 facility lost its funding, I came back to the Frito plant, uh, put in an application. I was invited to return based on my skills. They put me in as a temp, which is fine. But then uh, there was a problem. You see, Douglas had finished working out their mechanical problems with automated packing machines, which means that suddenly they need to replace 96 jobs, which of course means there's no room for any newcomers, which is me. So I, along with several, several others, were uh, handed a slip December 23rd telling us to turn in our badges and not to come back. This is the uh, Kansas Department of Labor, the unemployment office, if you will, um, because I went back to Frito-Lay. I was there for six months before they turned around and laid me off. I filed for unemployment, um, and I'm rejected again. This time, they claim that I didn't earn enough uh, money 
in the time that I was employed there to be eligible for unemployment, which I find kind of astonishing. Um, in the six months that I was there, I grossed about $14,000. There are people that make less than that in a year that claim unemployment, but for some reason or another, I'm not eligible based on the income level. Uh, it is what it is. I guess I'll just have to keep moving around. This is the Topeka Workforce Center, and what they do here is they're supposed to help you find a job when you're unemployed. The problem is that uh, the types of jobs that they have in a place like this are, I'm not qualified for. They're lower jobs, and I've got a lot of qualifications and a lot of education. And basically, their question is, what are we supposed to do with you? Not that I wouldn't take a lower job. i got to eat, and I have people to take care of. I don't, I don't mind. Work is work, and low job is better than no job. But they're not accustomed to dealing with this. Um, another thing that's interesting is a lot of the people uh, that are here, if you listen to them, or I listen to them, they talk a lot about... Uh, how to get over on unemployment and little tricks they do to get out of their job searches and things like that kind of defeats the entire purpose of the building even being here. I'm sure that's not everybody, but it's, uh, it's unfortunate that there are people that do it. It takes away from everyone else. Golden City, this is uh, Topeka's water department, and I had a brush with them this summer. They, uh, they had tied me into a previous address um, and gave me a bill that wasn't mine. It was a bill for almost, four, almost $550, actually. And I had no idea. I just came home one day and the water was off and there was a notice on the door. No warning, no notice, no nothing. And I contacted them, and there's nothing anybody can do, of course. No one can, nobody would listen, no one could do anything, um, no explanation, just pay off the balance or you have no water. And I had no choice. I have children at home. I had to get the water back on, so it had to be paid. Uh, and they won't even investigate it. They just stuck me with somebody's bill. Well, I'm out at Washburn University. Uh, this is where I would be going to school. I have uh, two associate's degrees and a 122 transferable credit hours and a 3.74 GPA. But I can't, uh, I can't afford to go back to school right now. I'd like to be able to finish up my degree for the program and I simply can't. And I refuse to get another student loan. I'm not doing it. All right, so ultimately the, uh, the big question is, who is at fault? Um, a big portion of it is mine. Poor decisions and poor associations. Uh, a big portion of it is the people that I was connected to, associations that I had made or alliances, partners who were uh, selfish, greedy, didn't care who they hurt. A portion of it is 
poor and outdated laws and administration, laws that don't make any sense, or agents that were really pushy or difficult. It's a combination of things. Um, people really need to learn to work together and stop trying to run each other over and crush each other to get something done, to meet a deadline, to satisfy some paperwork. Uh, people used to be more than paperwork. They're not anymore. It doesn't matter. As long as it looks good on paper and you can sit there and tell yourself that you did your job, everything is okay suddenly. In the last couple of decades, it's just gotten worse and worse that way. And this is the result. I was middle class America. Um, I started off on the bottom. I grew up in poverty. And I've worked almost my entire life. I've worked since childhood. And built up and built up. Had good jobs. Had education. And you can get crushed out of that very easily and very quickly. It only took a few months. And hopefully something can be learned from this little documentary. Good luck. People want what they want, when they want it, and they don't seem to care very much how they get it, or who they hurt, or how it's obtained. They, um, they have a very much whatever it takes kind of attitude, and it never occurs to them that whatever it takes is usually something that happens to someone else. The hardest part, aside from the obvious, I mean, I, I no longer have a house. I owe everybody. Um, I've got so much debt, I don't want to think about it. No more credit cards. Um, destroyed credit rating. I have, uh, I have two children I'm still responsible for, and it's a question of remaining able to to provide for them. I worry about that a lot. And also, after my my last separation from my second ex when I left, uh, that was about four years ago. And since then, I've gotten remarried. I've just gotten married just before all of this happened. And it happened fast. And so I have a, a new bride. And what about her? I don't want to drag her into my mess. I, I worry a lot about those things.